Welcome back to another episode of Control Alt Career, a podcast where we share stories of people who have taken a leap and embarked on an alternative career path in Asia. I'm your host, Jennifer Ong, and today I'm really excited to have my friend Jasmine Lau join us. Jasmine is the founder of PIM, Purpose in Motion, a social enterprise focused on teaching young leaders in China how to be the social entrepreneurs of the future. PIM has two main arms, one where they partner with universities to offer immersive courses, and one of these classes include giving students an opportunity to allocate $20,000 to a nonprofit of their choice, and two is an accelerator program that incubates social impact startups. Along the way, Jasmine has been awarded Forbes 30 Under 30 for her work with PIM, and aside from running PIM during the day, she is also part of the Gates Foundation and serves as a goalkeeper advisory board member for them. But before all of this, Jasmine was a girl from Hong Kong who, after graduating from Yale, had no idea what she wanted to do. She had done a few internships in banking and real estate before, but her heart was just never in it. She knew she was very interested in community service, but at this point in time, she had no idea how she could translate it into a full-time career. So Jasmine, tell us how this all started. So it actually started kind of from high school. I was very involved in different types of um, community service. And at that time, I didn't know anything about social entrepreneurship, but community service was a good way to get to understand the community. And one of the um, service projects I worked on was with these girls um, from rural China um, in Guangdong called Ember. And there, um, uh, many of these girls do not have money to go to school. And so we've been fundraising scholarships for them and one of the girls that we fundraised for, her name is Ocean, and she she said something that really kind of inspired me. Um, she said she was very jealous of me, and I thought she was jealous because, you know, we come from Hong Kong and materially had a better life, um, but she said she was really jealous of me because I had the privilege and opportunity to give, to give back and to help others, and for for me that like really sparked in me the idea that you know it shouldn't just be you know certain types of people who can give you know everyone um, should be able to feel like they can make a difference and that story just made me think that you know it is so important that everyone no matter their background no matter their financial background their age they do really want to make a difference and then when I was at Yale I studied economics like a good Asian kid right and was like doing all these internships in banking and in real estate and I didn't really find the spark. Like I noticed that when I was doing um, a banking internship that I would be secretly working on a service project behind my Excel spreadsheets. And that's when I realized, okay, you know, maybe that isn't my passion. And so um, in my senior year at Yale, I took a class on philanthropy. Um, and that class um, has a very similar model to what PIM is doing now. It's the impetus of what we're doing now. Um, gave us $50,000 as a class and did asked us how we should best make use of this money. So we had to go out and work with local nonprofits and identify what is their impact and how to measure it. I mean, then decide as a class which ones we wanted to support. And that was the best class I have taken. And it introduced me to a new space that I have not thought about in terms of a career um, because I met all these social entrepreneurs and great organizations. And so it, you know, it, became something that I uh, was very passionate about. And, and when I went to China to do my master's, my first idea was, okay, maybe I can take this class and, and develop it in China because there's lots of people who want to do philanthropy in China and they also don't know how to do it. The philanthropy space is super, super new. But what happened is that, you know, developing a class ended up being actually an organization. And uh, you know, now I've been working on this for seven years and uh, it just kind of spun out of that. Mm. So you were always interested in community service. And I, and I remember back in high school, you were always very involved in community service. And it's interesting to see how that interest and passion really came through throughout all the years, like even in college, and then you were able to make a career out of it. Did you deliberately think, oh, okay, after I graduate from college, uh, I want to turn my passion in community service into uh, a career? Or were you also 
interviewing for corporate jobs, you know, maybe, you know, maybe banking and real estate wasn't the thing for you, but were there other corporate jobs that you were also uh, considering at, at that time when you graduated? Mm-hmm. Oh, I was all over the place. I, I didn't really know. So I interviewed for everything. I interviewed for banking jobs and consulting jobs. I also thought about being a lawyer right, and, and applied to law school, got into law school. But ultimately, why I decided to go into a master's in China was because I felt like I wanted to do something that was different, but I, did, but I didn't know what it was. And so in some ways, I was trying to buy my time and going to China was a way for myself to explore certain aspects of my own identity and explore certain aspects of what I you know, cared about in a different context. Honestly, I feel like in college, I was not very strategic um, and I happened to land on something that I really do like. But looking back, I think the, the most important um, thing I did um, was kind of a process of elimination of understanding what I didn't like and what I didn't want um, and using that as a way to guide it forward and also using exploration as a mindset. I share very similar, I guess, experiences as you, because when I graduated, I also was like all over the place. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I think I had even less clear of an idea of what I was passionate about. So I guess I got like swept into the whole like, you know, a company's like recruiting and then, you know, apply for the jobs that they recruit for and then kind of just got sucked into the corporate career path. So I'm really happy that you managed to fight all of that and be able to per- pursue something that you you were very interested in. But I do want to ask you when all of your friends were recruiting for all these like, quote unquote, prestigious jobs, did you ever feel like left out? Mm-hmm. Or I-, I guess, like, how did you find the courage to kind of just pursue this idea yeah yeah so I would say I think in college I definitely felt really confused and especially like you mentioned when all the firms are coming to recruit and it's presented as this is your only option to success (laughs) um, right and that you know it felt like a lot of pressure but once I kind of got into the real world like when you started um, working on things I realized that there's no one path one one great thing about Beijing is that it's a very entrepreneurial city and so I started meeting all these people who were doing really cool things that I had never even heard of when I was in college right people who are like a food entrepreneur trying to do 3d printing on food right or people who were starting um, nonprofits uh, or people who are you know writers and uh, people who are thinking about how to influence policy and it's just very very um, fascinating for me and it gave me the courage and um, space to say hey maybe um, there's certain things that I liked which I thought was a hobby could also actually become a career because I saw other people doing that and so once I think you leave the school bubble um, and started meeting other people I think I started defining success as not so much as like you know that path that was presented to you by these like big firms but really as um, something that can be very multifaceted and I also know people who just jump around and try different things so I think the courage came from there. Mm. I think that's very interesting like that you were able to reset your definition of success and I think a lot of people who maybe surround themselves with friends who are following more traditional path, this might be one of those big, bigger challenges for them. Mm-hmm. So during this period of time, you were uh, studying your master's in Beijing, and you were also then working on PIM at the same time. How did it go from an idea into an actual product? So our original idea was just to start a class, right, and teach people philanthropy and give them a small fund to to give out. So we first started by finding a university partner that was willing to work with us um, because we thought that that would give us the credibility. And so we had to just leverage our connections um, and networks to try to get introductions um, to uh, a university um, and we, through friends, uh, got introduced to University of Hong Kong. Um, and then as for like recruiting students, it was again, you know, doing a lot of kind of free events, telling people about who we are. And we recruited students, not just from Hong Kong. At that time, we recruited students from all around China to come to Hong Kong. So we you know, also did uh, 
posters and WeChat. We, we worked with different universities to tell them about our program. And one of the things that I think I learned from this process is just how, you know, sometimes you just really do have to use cold email and try to like leverage whatever connection you had. So we drew from the Yale alumni database a lot to try to get connections. And we emailed actually the CFO of Alibaba, uh, Joe Tai, uh, a Yale Law School alum. And he actually responded, um, which surprised wow. us completely. And that was just really, really invaluable lesson for me to learn and just gain that confidence to just reach out when you need help. You never know who's willing to help you. And I think that when we're trying to find your first customers, when you're trying to find your first partners, when you're trying to find your first funders, the biggest challenge for people is just the mental barrier of putting yourself out there. But once you do, actually, you'll find that people, most people actually do want to help, um, especially if you do have a, a mission, right? And your mission is not just making money, but your mission is something that has um, societal value and people are very willing to help. So you originally started a course teaching university students in Hong Kong how to become social entrepreneurs. After that, I guess the course had good success and then you guys decided mm -hmm. to expand it into other things. I, I guess like how did you go from one course to a full-fledged company? Yeah, yeah. Um, to develop into an organization, we then ended up joining an accelerator um, called China Accelerator. And we applied to try to learn more about entrepreneurship. Um, and we got in and, and I think that was one of the ways one of the times when I first uh, started hearing terms like lean startup, you know, design thinking and things I have never heard of before. But the whole idea about entrepreneurship movement is testing things, right? And then refining it and growing that way. And I think it's actually almost like completely opposite of what um, you're taught in schools, especially when you go to a very highly competitive schools where you cannot make any mistakes. In entrepreneurship, they actually say, you know, you have to fail fast. You have to learn from your mistakes. You have to validate your market. So I think the, the um, China Accelerator really helped us to think about, okay, how we approach our idea generation, how we get it to users, how we get the feedback and continue to grow from there. It's kind of almost like a mini MBA, right? It consolidated into uh, three months where I realized my Yale education actually didn't give me any real skills in running or in business other than learning how to think, right? But like, I didn't know anything about marketing. I didn't know anything about HR hiring. So I think that was just a really great bootcamp. So we kind of emerged from it with a lot of tools um, that we can use and a process um, that we can apply um, to continuing testing different things and, and build that into uh, you know a sustainable business so when you when you entered into the accelerator program you were thinking about growing the course to be something that could be scaled across multiple universities not only in Hong Kong but to broader China and to the US and because you guys wanted to scale the the course you thought that the best way to do that would be to get uh, into an accelerator program to get a bit more guidance from people? Was that the original intent? Mm -hmm. um, and yes. you needed the money because uh, in the course you were offering people, you know, $20,000 to invest in other social causes. Is that why you needed the money? Initially, yes, that was the biggest sum that we needed. But then also as you started to grow, um, we wanted to hire staff. There's lots of costs that starts coming in when you uh, do run it as a full-time thing. And, uh, and when you have a company, you need a, you know accountants and all these things. So gradually it became larger. But initially, yes, what we needed was just that funding so that we could have this experiential course because we didn't want to run a course where people just hypothetically thought about how they would help, right? We wanted a course where people felt like, okay, we have this funding, we have this responsibility to give it out and, and support organizations. We have to do our, do our due diligence on these organizations. 
Initially, the accelerator was a way to build a track record. And then after we had some kind of successful products under our belts, then um, it was much easier to convince bigger donors or bigger investors to come in. And so then we started getting uh, funding from um, you know, uni- like, you know, universities like Peking University or like the Gates Foundation. So that that kind of all happened after we had to prove our track record. Uh, but initially, when you have no track record, I think accelerators and maybe like you know, friends and family, right? As a as a crowdfunding campaign, uh, is 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 the easiest way to kind of get started. Got it. So tell us a little bit more about the whole fundraising process, because I know right now with so many startups out there, everybody talks about fundraising and that concept sometimes it feels very familiar, but also very unfamiliar. Like you hear that term all the time, but actually like how do people go through fundraising? How does that all work? How do you find money? Yeah. And I do think, um, uh, Nonprofit and for-profit fundraising, there's a difference actually um, in terms of how how it works, and we've done a little bit of each. So uh, maybe I'll start with kind of nonprofit because it's probably a bit less familiar for people. So nonprofit fundraising, there's often you know one one is just like kind of individual campaigns, right? Individual donors and kind of major donors that you would reach out to, and that often kind of comes through cultivating connections and 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 really introducing people to your cause. And, and building that relationship and also allowing people to see the impact of the, your work. And there's another part of nonprofit fundraising, which is getting grants from foundations. And for that, it's a very kind of lengthy process, um, lots of lots of documents and um, lots about kind of evaluation and track record. And for f- a lot of foundations, they generally don't even consider you until you're like maybe two to three years in um, and you have something you can prove to them. Um, so it's more of a longer game, but then once you do that, oftentimes they support you for multiple years. So that is a really nice thing where you can get a three-year grant or a five-year grant and, and, you know, that can keep you not thinking about, you know, immediate fundraising all the time. And for, and their, their value, obviously, they, they still need to look at your budget, but they also care a lot about the impact and they have a lot more reporting. And then on the for-profit side, to be honest, we we tried doing some of that in the big beginning, but because we're a social enterprise, like people started saying like, okay, it's like, you know, does it make sense for you to get for-profit funding? If you do get for-profit funding, people often force you to grow in a certain direction. An example I like to give is a Mobike. Um, You know, Mobike, this is like this bike sharing company um, in China. And they actually, they started off with a a really clear social mission where they're trying to reduce kind of environmental damage, right, by, by moving people towards biking as opposed to taking cars. And they they actually won social enterprise of the year in China. But one of the things that made it really difficult for them to continue prioritizing just that social and environmental cause as first and foremost is because they took they took a lot of for-profit funding. And at that point, investors you know, push them towards profit. And so then, you know, there's a lot of backlash against Mobike where you see like all these bikes, like these mountains of bikes that are like heaped in like these uh, uh, left and use, right? Like broken bikes and and, and it's, it's a waste. And I think that kind of like illustrates the dynamic sometimes of like, if you do take for profit funding and your investor doesn't understand your social impact or like your social mission as much, um, they could kind of force you to go in a direction that is against your own original original intent. So kind of learning more about that, we decided we weren't, you know, that scaling, um, we didn't need it to do it that quickly. And we really wanted to be very solid in kind of our model and very solid in our social impact prior to seeking that type of funding to avoid things kind of going in, in the wrong direction. So we didn't get um, for-profit um, investors funding, so equity mm-hmm. type funding. Um, we still have, we charge a lot of for-profits for, our, you know, our program. So we have income from them, but we didn't take like, you know, an, a million dollar equity, right? Like trying to, to do that because um, the kind of strings that come with um, trying to shape your uh, company in a certain direction. So it sounds like there is a nonprofit side of your business and a for-profit side. Tell us a little bit more about your business model. 
currently PIM is what we call a hybrid. So we have a for-profit company and then we also have a nonprofit fund. And the reason for that is because we're trying to leverage the, the power of the market, um, but then also the importance of giving back and supporting community values. So our hybrid um, in our for-profit side, our income comes from clients um, paying us for our programs and services. So these are universities, these are companies, and these uh, could be individuals, right, And as they pay for the programs. And then our kind of nonprofit side, we get donations and grants from foundations um, to kind of support the work to make it more accessible. So what we try to do is that, you know, we set a kind of fair market price, but we often offer scholarships or sponsorships for either universities or individuals who are not able to pay that fee. I mean, that way, we are also able to leverage the grants um, and funding from foundations to support that work. Broadening out our conversation a little bit, tell us a little bit more about the nonprofit social entrepreneurship landscape in China. What does that look like? Yeah, so the social sector is quite young in China. Um, I think it only started because the kind of the concept of of civil society or social sector is very new. Generally, for the longest time, the government tries to provide. And so it's a big government and small social sector. But in recent years, I think there are two main trends that really shaped it. One is just private wealth, you know, the emergence of all these entrepreneurs. And a lot of them um, followed, um, I think Bill Gates at that time reached out to Chinese um, entrepreneurs and said, you know, we should try to make uh, donations, uh, you know, increase our philanthropy uh, to support society. And so that was one kind of impetus and, and a lot of, you know, entrepreneurs like Jack Ma, Jet Li, you know, like people like that started giving. And so that's one area where it, 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 it made the sector grow much faster. The other area I do think is that from, from more bottom up, um, there's actually a lot of interest. So uh, like from earthquakes and disaster relief, like there's so many people who wanted to help after the Sichuan earthquake, volunteering, building houses and building shelters. So I think even from that emerged like all these organizations um, that were like just structured around uh, supporting social sector work. And one thing um, I would say it's challenging in China is that uh, because of the nature of kind of the party and the government, you don't see a lot of advocacy work. That's quite challenging, but you see a lot of social services. And increasingly, the government is, you know, they, they like to think about like outsourcing some of their work to these social service organizations. So, you know, what we see is that like a lot of new models of uh, you know, adapting to these social services and uh, a lot of interest in kind of right now is poverty alleviation. So there's a lot of interest in that. One thing I would say is, is challenging though is if um, there are certain topics that are often quite sensitive in China and knowing how to navigate that. So we always try to work with like the universities or like people who are very close to the ground to know what are certain things that people allow and what are certain things that, you know, can consider sensitive and try to navigate it that way. Shifting gears towards something a bit more personal, Going back to when you decided um, you wanted to pursue this full time, when you told your parents or your family and friends that you were going to do this, what was their reaction? Were they like very supportive and they were like, oh, like amazing, like super cool? Or were they like, what? What is that? <laughs> yeah, I agree. I think that in Asian societies, there's a huge pressure to find something stable. At first, I definitely did not frame this as a career decision with my parents. I said it's an extracurricular, a project that I'm working on. And in some ways, I think like they're used to me doing all these projects, right? Or like these things at school. So so they just they were like, oh, sounds really nice, right? It sounds like a good project. And then when I told them, mm, you know what, I'm going to apply to an accelerator and do this full time right that's when they started being like oh okay what is 
this, <laughs> right? It's like turn from a fun, nice project that Jasmine is doing to help the world to like, oh, wait, is this actually a career or like, and I think ultimately what, what kind of brought them around is I think parents just want us to be happy. And so what I did is I tried to show them that I was happy and I'm growing. Like, even if I failed, I'm growing and learning. And this is kind of like a mini MBA that I'm taking, right? This is like an experience that I'm doing. And I tried to include them in our events and things. Um, so I invited my mom to like one of the events so she could understand what I was doing. She like then became a huge supporter. Um, and so it's, it's very hard sometimes when parents, especially when it's like a really alternative career and things that they've never even heard of, you know, from their generation, it's, it's really just trying to include them and show them how happy you are or like how purposeful you feel and then include them so that they can see that impact and, and giving them kind of time and patience because it's not like it is really different from what they are knowing. So I always tell them, you know, like, yeah, I, I'm okay with failing, right? And I think I've learned X, Y, Z. I've learned these things. I know, you know, how to run, you know, a, a team. I know all these skills. And so if I fail, I can find a job. Don't worry. <laughs> you know, I have these skill sets and it's not wasting something. And I think for a lot of parents, like just, you know, feeling that, okay, you know, you are growing from this and articulating what you're learning makes them feel more comfortable um, with their, your decision. Great. I think that's honestly one of the more difficult hurdles that I think a lot of Asians face when they decided to do something different. So for you, did you ever think about working for a corporate since you've spent your whole life working in a startup and being an entrepreneur? Are there any parts of, you know, the corporate world that you feel like you missed out on that you would want some exposure to? Actually, this is like an annual question that I revisit. Almost every year, I would be like, okay, oh, how am I doing with my organization? Am I learning? Am I growing? And am I missing out on certain things that could help me grow more? And I think in the earlier years, I thought about, okay, maybe should I get an MBA or should I go work at a corporate so that I can see how big companies work? And am I missing out by not having that experience, right? Of like seeing what scale is, seeing what process and bureaucracy and all of these things, <laughs> how the world works. Um, but then later on, I realized that, um, you know, there's pros and cons, right? Like there are trade-offs when you do go into that type of environment and the flexibility and the things that I am doing right now, I'm still growing and learning so much. And so what I try to do is that I try to create opportunities for myself to learn about what large institutions do and be part of that without leaving my current job. And so I did a few things. One was that I did a, a half-year fellowship with the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, uh, the foundation um, that's based in New York um, from the Rockefeller family. And it's a very old institution. It's not very large, but it's fairly old and established. And I spent that some time there to learn about how it works and did a half-year uh, fellowship learning about impact investing. And then I also um, applied to become an advisory board member for Gates Foundation. And that, again, Gates Foundation is one of the largest largest foundations in the world and being part of like the advisory board I get to see one part of like how the foundation functions and also get to interact with different types of stakeholders that I normally might not interact with so that's how I try to to you know create these opportunities for myself without necessarily leaving my job my, my day job at PIM and I think so far it has kind of worked out for me in, in trying to be creative about getting that experience. As an Asian, there's the view that you need to be financially secure rather than to pursue your passion. What do you think of this statement? And in relation to your own career, do you feel like by following your dreams and your passion, the financial reward has followed as well? First of all, I do think like you can never just say finances is not important, right? Like that, that is just kind of delusional. But I think Asians are generally much more conservative, right? Like they value that financial stability so much higher than anything else. Like maybe even their own health or their own happiness, right? They will work themselves to the bone, right? Like just for that financial reward. And so one of the things I think um, 
it, it's maybe time bound it, right? And say, I give myself one year to see if this thing is going to work out. And if it has some semblance of financial sustainability, if not, I go back to a job. What my belief is there's just so many ways you can make money and really is not just like working for a large corporation and, and something you don't like is not the only way. If there are other people who are passionate about the same things that you are, then you can actually build a community and build your own job around that. So I think the way we learn about careers or not learn about careers when we're in school is so flawed and so far away from the real world in terms of what actually can happen. I completely agree with you. I think what we learn in school and the training that we get doesn't really quite prime you towards figuring out what it is that you want to do in life. I almost wish that there was at least a class in school that focused on career development and kind of gave you exposure to all the different jobs there are out there. I think that would have been so, so, so helpful, especially for myself. So it seems like everything in your life kind of worked out in the end. You know, while you started off not knowing what you wanted to do when you graduated from school, you eventually found your way there and has been very, very successful in your career. I guess if you were to redo this, is there anything you would do differently? I would say um, one thing is ask for help earlier and ask for help constantly because I think I have trouble asking for help. And every time I do it, it has manifested into some of the nicest things um, that have happened to me, like friends becoming colleagues because I asked for their help. Um, and I always thought that, oh, you know, people wouldn't want to do this um, or that, you know, I, I'll be a burden. Um, so that's one area. Um, and the other area I think um, increasingly is, is self-care. And I think a lot of people, you know, not just entrepreneurs, right? Like everyone who are kind of go-getters in their own career where they're constantly thinking about achieving. And, and even for me, I always try to occupy my time. I always try to do things and I felt anxious about stopping because I, I worried that when I stop, I will be failing. So I was constantly rushing around and feeling stressed. And it's like funny because it's like, I'm my own boss, but I'm just like working myself like 80 hours in a week. And I realized that it is a long game. It's like your own inner well-being is so important. So I think what I would tell myself to do differently is to spend more time reflecting what is important to you, right? Being okay with like taking some time for yourself because it is a long game when you're stressed, like you actually put out the stress to other people as well. So I think self-care is not just like, oh, you know, good for you, but it actually is good business sense. It's good um, for the organization when people have a balanced lifestyle and when people actually have time to kind of reflect on what they're doing and not just constantly just like, you know, doing the next thing and chasing after KPIs. I think that's a really good point. And also actually something that my last interviewer also spoke about. So Joyce, in episode two, she also mentioned that one of the key things that she would share as advice for future entrepreneurs is self-care and mental health because it's so easy to really keep pushing yourself and then burn out really early on. And, you know, you are your company. <laughs> Without you, the company will not be where it is today. So take really good care of your health. I think it's interesting to see that you guys are both doing such different things, but share a very similar view on, you know, taking care of yourself as the number one priority. One final question before we close off, you know, any advice for people who are thinking about being a social entrepreneur or thinking about going into philanthropy and nonprofit? So I would say um, is to kind of fall in love with the problem and not your solution. Um, because your solution will change. Like a lot of times things do evolve. Um, it will be very different. But what we are trying to pick is the field you want to be in and the kind of the problem or the area you, you want to be solving and investing in. So I think that's really important for an entrepreneur not to just be so tied up with your own idea and be open to listening from other viewpoints, uh, but better be focused on your mission, right? Your mission should stay the same. Like this is the problem you want to solve, this the people you want to serve, those things should stay the same, uh, but kind of be open-minded in, in looking at uh, different, different approaches to do that. And in terms of for people who sometimes come to me and say, hey, I don't really know what my passion is. Like, I really want to do something different, but I don't really know. There's a, a book I really like called Design Your 
Life by a Stanford professor, and they said actually, uh, majority of people don't really know what their passion is. It's, it's important to find a place where your kind of interest, skills, and purpose lies, but sometimes it doesn't mean that it has to be your passion. It could just be things that you find meaningful, and so. So an example is like a passion could be a hobby, like playing piano or playing computer games, and it might be really hard to make a career out of it. But a purpose is bigger, right? It's the type of life you want or issues you want to do. You want to make a dent in it, and you can kind of identify that and try to find how it intersects with like your interests and your skill sets. And when in doubt. Just go explore. Ask people, right, who are doing similar things. I think what、um, Jen, what you're doing with、um, this podcast is amazing because I think sometimes we just don't see enough of what other people are doing before we come into a career. So a lot of times, like people go into being a lawyer without ever actually knowing what a lawyer really does. Like they only see like these like <laughs> TV shows, right, and they imagine that's what a lawyer is, right. But sometimes just actually understanding what people are doing. Doing, um, and using that as a way to kind of reverse engineer:、um, is that something you're interested in? Or maybe even just doing a project or a little internship or volunteer with、uh, an organization before you get started, so that you have a sense of: okay, is this something I enjoy? Is this something that my skills and passion and and, and、uh, or skills and purpose、uh, align? And on that note, I think this is a good time for us to conclude the interview today. So, just wanted to thank Jasmine for all of your insights and all of your advice that you've shared with us today. It's been so exciting to see your journey from when we were, I don't know, fifteen, sixteen, to all the way now when we are in our thirties. <laughs> so, I think it's been super cool to be able to celebrate all the successes that you've had、uh, along the way. And there you have it, my conversation with Jasmine. Here's a couple key takeaways that I got from this conversation. One, don't be shy to cold email. You'd be surprised at how willing people are to help. I mean, she even got through to Alibaba's CFO Zhou Tai. Two, self-care is critical, not just for your personal well-being, but also in order for your business to thrive. And lastly, when trying to bring your parents on board with your alternative career, it's about getting them involved and educating them about all the things that you are doing. Sometimes they're only skeptical because they have no idea what your job entails, and of course, showing them how happy and fulfilled you are. So there you have it. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Control Alt Career. Check back in two weeks from now for our next episode, where I'll be interviewing the founders of Style Theory, and hear how they started Southeast Asia's largest fashion rental platform. This is an episode you definitely won't want to miss. Until then. 